All right, let's get started. So this is the afternoon deep learning session. Uh, we have a first talk right now uh, on deep learning for predicting human strategic behavior. This is presented by Jason Hartford. Thanks. Um, this is joint work with my co-authors James Wright and Kevin Nathan Brown. And let's talk about game theory. So many of you are probably familiar with game theory. You may have heard of it. So my one sentence summary about game theory is that it's a powerful mathematical framework for reasoning about the strategic interactions of agents. And typically in, in game theory, what we do is we assume that these agents are perfectly rational. And that may be totally reasonable in certain circumstances. But if you're trying to use game theory to make predictions about human behavior, it turns out that this just leads to really poor dis descriptions of what actually goes on. Right. So that's the bad news. But the good news is that people aren't totally unpredictable. It's not like they're uniformly randomizing over their actions. It's just that the perfect rationality assumption is a really poor description of what's going on in people's heads. Right. So as a running example, let's think about the rock, paper, scissors game that you're probably all familiar with. And let's say that the loser plays, pays the winner one euro, um, if there is a winner. And we'll say, to make the game a little bit more interesting, we'll say if the winner wins with rock, um, the loser pays the winner two euros. Now, that non-uniform payoff makes the game a little bit more tricky to think about. But one way you might reason about it is you might think, well, my opponent's probably going to play rock, right? Because it's the highest payoff action in the game. So I should respond by playing paper. Okay. And then you'll look around you and say, well, there's a whole bunch of smart people in this room. They probably all thought of that. So I should play scissors to beat my opponent who's playing paper. You can kind of reason in this iterative fashion. Um, and this notion has a name in the behavioral game theory literature. It's known as iterative strategic reasoning. And it's the sort of most successful model that we know of that it, it, from the behavioral game theory literature in terms of predicting actions for players in these games. Now, if players were reasoning like this, we'd expect to see a distribution over actions that looked something like this. Right? We'd have a lot of people playing scissors and all thinking that they're beating the suckers playing paper. Turns out there aren't that many of them, and then you'd have even fewer people playing rock, right? So this is an example of a two-player simultaneous move game. And these games can be represented in so-called normal form by simply listing the payoffs associated with each action in a big matrix, where each matrix cell represents an outcome. And then we index the rows of the, of the matrix by the row player's action and the columns of the matrix by the column player's actions. And our learning goal in this paper is to take these normal form representations of the game and then descriptions of what people actually did when they played these games and learn a model that can map from, to, from a normal form description of the game to the best, best distribution um, in an unseen game. Right? So best prediction for, over the distribution in an unseen game. So this seems like a straightforward machine learning problem. Right? We have a bunch of data in the form of these normal form games. And we have observations of what's actually happening in these games. So let's try and apply our favorite machine learning model. And we're sitting in the deep learning session. So let's try and apply a feed forward net. Okay. And we can do this, right? We can flatten the payoff matrix into one long vector, um, run it through a number of hidden layers. We're trying to map to a distribution. So let's put a softmax on the output. We can train to maximize the likelihood of the training data, um, or equivalently minimize the, the negative log likelihood. This is all kind of bread and butter. But what happens if I see a game like this in our test set, right? So we can call it a test set game because it's, you know, it is the payoff matrix looks different to our training set. But I'd argue that our model is going to perform pretty poorly on this test set game, right? So even though the game is strategically identical to a game that we've seen in the original pay in the original description. Right. So originally, I was presenting the role player with rock, paper, scissors. Now I'm saying the role player has actions rock, scissors, paper. But the model has learned parameters that associated weight, the sort of scissors weighter weights with paper, and the paper weights with scissors. Right? So this is going to lead to sort of poor predictions. Right? So we might be able to get around this by doing some data augmentation during training, um, or showing a lot of training examples. But a more fundamental problem is if I add an action to the game, right? our model just can't make a prediction anymore. And that seems kind of sad, because the action I've added to the game leaves the game strategically almost identical to what we had originally. 
Okay, so this is the sort of nuclear action, which if the role player plays it, both the role player and the column player have to pay me five euros. Right? So we wouldn't really expect anyone to play that action. So it's sad that we can't use what we've learned in the three by three game to say something about the four by three game. Okay. So clearly a off the shelf feed forward network isn't what we want to do here. Um, but let's think a bit more carefully what game theory tells us would be described like a good behavioral model. The first thing we'd want is we'd want invariance to permutations of the payoff matrix. Um, so we want games that are strategically equivalent to lead to equivalent pay, uh, predictions up to a permutation of the output, right? We'd want invariance to size of the input matrix, right? So we want to be able to reason about sort of counterfactual questions. So we ask our model counterfactual questions about what happens if we change the player's action sets, okay? And thirdly, our model should be able to facilitate rich comparisons between outcomes, right? So game theory is fundamentally about reasoning about different outcomes in a game and then sort of making a decision conditional on what we think of these different outcomes. So we better be able to represent the kind of reasoning that players, human players are gonna make about these games. And finally, we'd want our model to be able to represent iterative strategic reasoning explicitly because we know that this is the sort of most successful previous behavioral game theory model. Right. So it turns out we can satisfy the first requirement with the following simple modification to a feed forward network. Let's take every scalar node in the network and replace it with a matrix of same size as our input payoff matrix. Okay. So, and then we define each node to be the weighted sum of the nodes in the preceding layer, so as usual, right? So now we have a model that maps from matrices to matrices instead of scalars to scalars. And this model is gonna be permutation invariant because if we apply any permutation to the input payoff matrix, that's just gonna propagate through our network as we desire. And it's size invariant because if we change the size of our input payoff matrix, our model can still apply because all we're doing here is we're leveraging the fact that scalar matrix multiplication is invariant to the size of the matrix. Right? So this weighted sum still can be applied. Right? And then we can apply an element-wise activation function as we usually do, and that allows us to learn nonlinear representations of the input. Okay. So that seems nice, but there's a limitation to this approach. And that's that we've essentially constrained each element of the hidden units to depend only on the corresponding elements from the layers below. Right? Um, so this animation tries to show that where the red element is only a function of the orange element and none of the ele other elements of the input matrix, right? And why do we say this is an, an issue? Well, what we've essentially done is we've constrained our model to treat, e treat each outcome in the game, so each cell in the input matrix as independent of each other, right? And this is problematic because if we return to our rock, paper, scissors example with the nuclear action, we kind of said, when I said presented it, I said, well, no one's really gonna play that action, right? But implicitly what I was doing when I said that was I was appealing to the fact that the nuclear action provided outcomes that were worse than any other outcomes in the payoff matrix, right? So at the very least, but if I were to instead present a game that is high stakes rock, paper, scissors with a nuclear action, right? Where the loser pays the winner at least a thousand euros then what we're gonna see is we'd probably see a lot of people playing that nuclear action, right? Because a lot of people wouldn't be prepared to risk losing a thousand euros and would pre prefer to bound their, their loss at, at five euros, right? So at the very least, we'd like to be able to have a model that can compare between a particular outcome and the best or worst case thing that can happen associated with that action, right? And so this is the intuition between our so-called action pooling units what they do is they take a hidden unit as input and they output the row and column wise maxima um, and then feed those maxima as uh, uh, these vectors of maxes as inputs to the subsequent layers, right? And this allows us to learn a much flex more flexible class of behavioral models and represent most of the behavioral game theory functions that are useful in the literature. So at this point we have a model that can kind of learn a interesting representation of our input matrix, but what we really want is to be able to make a prediction about, about the role player's actions. And we do this in a pretty straightforward way. What we do is we take the final hidden units in the final layer, we sum uniformly over the column player's action, that gives us a number of vectors, we apply softmaxes to the resulting, um, to, those, to those resulting vectors, that gives us a number of distributions, and then we take their weighted sum to produce our final output, where the weights are learned. 
So this gives us a model that can map from some arbitrary input payoff to a distribution over the row player's actions and allows some sort of flexible comparisons between outcomes through the, max, through the action pooling units. Um, but what about iterative strategic reasoning? Now, to see how we can incorporate that into our model, um, what we might want to do is return to uh, the action response layers. Um, so when I first described iterative strategic reasoning in the context of a normal form game, what I said was that we focus first on our, our opponent playing rock. <clears throat> and so we kind of ignored all the other actions that our opponent played and just focused our attention on, on the rock action and then chose, uh, chose an outcome given that. Right? And mathematically, we can represent this by saying, instead of taking a uniform sum over how much we like each outcome, right, let's take a weighted sum where, we, where our weights are given by the likelihood of our opponent playing that action. Right? But then the question comes, where do these weights come from? Well, we've just developed a model that can take an input payoff matrix as input and map to a distribution over a particular player's actions. Right? So we can reuse that architecture to get a distribution over the column player's actions now and use that to do a weighted sum. Okay. So this is the intuition behind our action response layers that we introduce. Um, what they do is they compute weighted sums over the opposition actions where the weights are given by the model's predicted distribution of that player's actions. Um, and then we can repeat this process recursively, sort of taking in distri different distributions over actions in order to do a number of steps of iterative reasoning instead of only a single step, right? So that seems nice. How does the model do when we evaluate empirically? Well, we, we evaluated it on a combined data set of nine behavioral experiments where mostly undergrads were literally paid to play these games. Um, we evaluate these models in terms of negative log likelihood, so lower is better. And to get a sense of scale, that pink line is the best model, is the best iterative strategic reasoning model out of the behavioral game theory literature. This blue line, it comes from the AI literature where they added weighted features, weighted handcrafted features to the iterative strategic reasoning model. Um, and this gives a number of different instantiations of our model with different hidden units. Um, and what we see is we see that any model that had two or more hidden layers gave us state-of-the-art performance. And our models that had, our best performing models gave a far larger improvement in performance than adding handcrafted features to this, um, to the setup. We found pooling units to be really important, right? We took our two best performing models and we removed pooling units and we found we got significantly worse performance, and in fact, worse performance in the simple iterative reasoning models. Um, the action response layers gave us better training set performance, right? So as we added action response layers, we improved our training set performance, but our test set performance diminished. And so it's a clear sign of overfitting. What's not so clear is whether this is a problem of regularization, that we haven't just figured out how we should properly regularize these models, or whether it's a data problem in that the games that in, in this behavioral data set may not be construct, may be sort of kind of constructed to be hard to reason about and not lend themselves to iterative reasoning. So that's not clear. Um, so in summary, what we have is we have a model that gives us state-of-the-art performance for predicting the behavior of human players um, in normal form games. It generalizes to games with an unseen number of actions, right? So even, ac even sort of numbers of actions that we haven't seen in our training set. And our model explicitly generalizes the iterative response style models from the behavioral game theory literature. Um, but what's interesting is our best performing models didn't need didn't need that iterative response component that we built in. So one interesting question that we might want to investigate in future is if it's not doing iterative response, kind of how is this model achieving its performance? So dig into the model performance a little bit more. And secondly, it would, it would be good to use this architecture, sort of expand on this architecture to model things like salience um, and allow for richer comparisons between actions. Right. So, so thanks for listening. Um, if, if you're interested, please come chat to us at the poster session and welcome for questions. Plenty of time for questions. I see a question on the left here. Yeah, I was wondering whether you could um, address how you would, um, ex you know, like uh, 
utilize a mini-max algorithm like, uh, for example, let's say playing tic-tac-toe, um, mm -hmm. what uh, approach would you take then expanding on this uh, to, to realize that? So by mini-max, sorry. So you're saying sort of repeated interactions or? Oh, mini-max, meaning um, zero-sum game um, where, uh, yeah. uh, right. Got you, okay. So, so this, this applies to any sort of single shot general sum game, right? So minimax games would, would you know, a zero sum game would just be a special class of that game. Um, and in a sense what we're doing here is we're modeling how people could play this game. And so you might want to use this, if, you, if you've got a model of how people could play this game, you could use this to sort of respond to how people would play it optimally. Um, so you could, you could definitely do that, right? So that gives you an expected distribution. That will give you a distribution of what your, post, your opposition's gonna play, and then you can choose your action to maximize your expected utility given that. Cool. Questions? Any more questions? No, it's not. Over here. <laughs> No, oh, sorry. So, did you do any analysis about how, the difference between um, how humans acted in the optimal action and sort of how inefficient humans were? Because that's sort of, you were modeling that, right? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, we even even sort of locking down what it means to be optimal is kind of is kind of tricky, right? Because you can be in these games. Um, you know, we've got loads of good mathematical theory that tell you how to be optimal with respect to, an, to, to a rational agent, right? But there are lots of examples of games where if you're playing against a, a player who's not behaving optimal, you want to just maximize against that player, right? So in short, the short answer is no, we didn't, we didn't kind of compare what the optimal response is to, to what humans were, um, were doing. And I think that is an interesting question. Say, you know, given that players are responding to each other, how, how, you know, how well, if you had this access to this model, how well could you have done, and how much more would that have given you over what's, you know, what humans are actually getting? So. Uh, did you think at all about how to extend this to games with multiple moves? Yes. Yeah, so By which I mean, you know, we're over time. Sequential. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's something that we, we, we definitely want to do. Um, it's a little more tricky to think about because you have to kind of, you have to model the sort of learning behavior over time as well, which is, which is tricky. So definitely want to continue that. Any last question? Okay, uh, as we set up, do you mind expanding a bit on the feature where you mentioned extending to salience and richer comparisons? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so, I, I mentioned salience, you know, one of the things that we leverage quite hard in this work is we say it's, you know, let's, let's assume the players are, that, that human players are invariant to the ordering of actions. Um, and that's actually not clear whether that's really the case empirically. Um, players might like, you know, the top left action because they read left to right, right? Um, so you might want a model that can, that can actually explicitly represent that, but you don't want to give up on on size invariance, because one of the really useful things about this is being able to ask your model sort of counterfactual questions about what happens if you change the action sets available to players, because this allows you to use this, thing, this for things like mechanism design and um, thinking about optimal design of games, right? Um, and then we also just, it's not clear that that's, that the, the action pooling units that we, that we developed kind of facilitate all the possible comparisons that players might be making in this game. So you might want to be, have a richer set of comparisons. Cool. Okay, let's thank our speaker.